Um, hey, well, thanks for everybody for accommodating the schedule change. I unexpectedly got myself into a schedule crunch and had nowhere to go but to move it up a day as opposed to pushing it to Thursday, which is usually my fallback day. But I unfortunately have committed to a personal commitment on Thursday as well. This week is one of those crazy weeks. It's usually, I'm usually not that, I don't really lead that interesting life typically in typical work, but there are John, exceptions. John, your audio is doing weird stuff again. Does anyone else hear that? Mm -hmm. um, yes. Yeah. Okay. So something, up. something strange about, um, yeah, I think you okay, were okay this, before that. Okay. Let me see. I'll just try to keep the, uh, Use your outside voice instead of your inside voice. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, let's see if we can get that. Yeah, you know, I've, it goes back to it. I do have to think about replacing my laptop. So this will be one of my plans for this year. So uh, mm -hmm. sorry about that. But I'll try to keep my voice at a loud enough decibel that hopefully will keep my microphone happy and that everybody else uh, good. But at any rate. Thanks everybody for attending. Um, I don't have many announcements. Um, I suppose we want to think about is uh, Castleton is the first weekend in March, first Sunday in March. And uh, people are purchasing tables slowly but surely. I expect a hockey stick effect where suddenly people wanting tables that start going up in February and start going upward. Um, I do post the latest uh table assignments on our website you go to the table space um link and you'll find there's a uh, right in the middle of the page there's a you know see what tables have been reserved um if you click on it, it just loads a pdf file and you can see what's what's been there uh we have plenty of tables left still um but we are i i posted three updates or so um which al Perkis does the table assignment so uh, when the buyer purchases the table, um, Jerry gets things organized in the spreadsheet, and then Al does the assignment. So if you haven't bought a table and are thinking about it, plenty of space left, but uh, don't let it go too late. You never know. But um, I think that's probably the biggest announcement. Um, otherwise, we'll be doing the normal Zoom cadence. I think next meeting should not change schedule-wise. Um, does that, anyone have any announcements or events they might want to raise awareness about? Um, you know, feel free to jump in. Well, Len uh, is, is, Len is uh, going to be doing a uh, talk for the AWA on Wednesday. And Len, maybe you could tell us a little bit, uh, just to remind us a little bit about why Rhode Island radios are so um, relevant to you. And uh, tell us about the talk you're going to do for the AWA group. When I think it's Wednesday uh, at 8 p.m. And I don't remember the date, but you, maybe you can tell us that, Len. Len, you're, you're right. muted. You're muted. Yeah, Good. actually, uh, I got started in Rhode Island Radio with the radio you're going to go over tonight, uh, Tom. That was the first one I got. And that started the whole ball rolling, I guess. Uh, yeah, you, I'm doing a talk. When did you when did you start uh, with uh, becoming interested in them, Len? It's going to be about forty years ago, <laughs> I would think. Yeah, now, yeah, I saw an ad in the paper for a uh, guy selling radios, and I went and looked, and that Giblin radio was there with the loop antenna and everything. And the funny part is, I uh. There was another guy there ready to buy it, but he was kind of like a used car salesman type guy. <laughs> and you know, the guy, the, the guy that was selling it knew he was just going to flip it. So uh, he wouldn't sell it to him. You know, the guy begged him. And then finally, when he left, he said, do you really want that radio? I said, yeah. And he sold it. To, he ended up selling it to me. So he says, I know, you, I know you'll keep it. So I've had it all these years. He was right. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So if anyone can make it, you know, uh, do register uh, for the event since uh, the email went out. Um, 
I actually, speak of which, Lynn, you also got an award. Did you not? Um, Not recently. What was the email that I saw on, um, that was public, that was put out on our uh, reflector? Did I miss something? Sorry, maybe it's my imagination, Lynn. No, I got I got some from the AWA a few years back for. Uh... Oh, that was a few years back because somehow I thought it was like this year, so I. Uh, so oh I'm no. Stupid it, but anyway, well, very good, very because I did see that because it is on your website. You wrote on the radio. I did actually see that, so that's for those. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's a a very belated congratulations that. <laughs> <laughs> based on that but uh nevertheless you know uh len is our you know probably our club as well as probably national expert on word on the radio so um yeah, it's an excellent website if you haven't had a chance to take a look at it go to you know word on radio dot com dot org right um well yeah, yeah it's an excellent uh, website bill you could spend hours on it uh, well a nicely done website uh len um thanks but um okay so does anyone um have any recent acquisitions or items they want to show before we kick off the main um agenda yes i guess not well then without further ado here's a topic we've been trying to schedule in we've always we've struggled to get into one of our meetings but we have both players and so there was uh you may recall Probably last year, you know, we were um, there was a discussion over uh, Oops.io about unique Iblin uh, tuning circuit, and Tom pointed out some interesting behaviors. And so we wanted to do a presentation on more of the details on it. So what I'd like to do is hand this off to Tom and Len to perhaps go over this. Okay, yeah, let's see what we've got here. Um, give me a moment to get oh, sure. uh, lined up here, John. <clears throat> yeah. Um, almost there. Uh, let's see, where are we? Uh, sorry. No. Thought I had this ready to go. Uh, stand by one uh, current slide. Uh, <clears throat> Slideshow and current slide. Okay, so uh, let's see if I can share this. Uh, and, um, okay, can we see the Giblin? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, Len, um, tell us a little bit about it and uh, what... Well, we, we now know how you found it, but uh, tell us a little bit about the background, anything you want. What I'll do is uh, I'll, uh, uh, when we get to, I'll uh, show a few more pictures of it and then go down to the circuit diagram and we can do a, an analysis of that. Over to you. Well, it's, uh, as you can see by the portholes, it's a uh, 6 tube radio. Uh, it, the loop antenna is actually part of the circuit the front end um it's got uh three audio outputs as you can see down there you can uh and that is and actually all the advertisements i've seen show that that uh, speaker with it that's not a gibbon speaker it's a uh, music master i think so i guess that they sold it as a set the the loop antenna the the radio and the uh, speaker and I've seen advertisements in newspapers all over the country for it. So he, he sold stuff everywhere. He was from Pawtucket, Rhode Island, Giblin. And uh, a few things, he was the, uh, the disputed inventor of the honeycomb coil. There's a couple of people that don't think he was, but 
from what everything I've read, it seems like it was him. Uh, he also, uh, I don't know if you are familiar with the NC-4 flight, the, the Navy flight across the Atlantic. Oh, sure. He also made the coils in, the, in those radios on that flight. Oh, interesting. So he was famous for that as well. I don't know what else I could say about it. Uh, so they, that's a newspaper article I ended up getting with it. Oh, interesting. That explains how to tune it. And that's the antenna. So this is the uh, the, the um, antenna that they sold with the radio. And I'd just like to read a little bit from the instruction book on it. Uh, they make a really big deal about this antenna. I guess they wanted to uh, pretend that they were the first people to come up with this thing. Um, it starts out, this is... Um, by James Caulfield, Associate uh, AIEE, uh, works on loops specifically designed for DX reception with loudspeaker volume. A copyright 1924, and it goes like this. Eventually, the outdoor antenna will be a thing of the past. This is not the writer's opinion, but a forecast of leading authorities. During a conversation with Major Armstrong some time ago, he stated that within a few years, the receiver using a loop antenna will be more in evidence than the present receiver using the outdoor antennas. The receiver illustrated on this page was designed by Thomas P. Giblin of the Standard Radio and Electric Company for the loop reception. It is particularly suited to one who cannot erect an antenna, but desires distant reception with a loop. <laughs> so they were really pushing that antenna. That's pretty funny. Um, um, anything else uh, that you want to say? Um, oh, here, here we go. The loop used with this receiver is of special design. An illustration of the loop will be found on this page. It is 52 inches high, 24 and one half inches wide, and six and one half inches deep. It is wound with 120 feet of braided enameled wire, making a total of 12 turns. The wires are wound horizontally instead of vertically. I had to think about that for a little yeah. while there, but actually what he meant was that you start with the loop in the back there and you gradually wind and wind and wind, you end up with the loop in front. And that's what he meant by horizontal, I think. The wires are wound horizontally instead of vertically, as is the practice with the pancake loop. This method of winding makes it possible to receive more signal energy. <laughs> so he's pushing it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, look at a, another picture here. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, the radio itself and the circuit diagram, and I put these both together um in this diagram does that come out okay um yeah that looks okay. great yeah so nice. what, we've, what we've got is uh, i put together a little picture of the front panel and i put together uh, the circuit diagram and i i uh, pointed uh to the appropriate pots or uh, variable resistors on the circuit diagram that are controlled by the knobs on the front panel and the reason that I was intrigued by this and uh, talked to Len about it was that I personally uh, did not know that uh, putting a, a pod in the filament lead of a tube uh, was a way of changing the amplification of the tube. Of course, it's going to change the temperature of the filament, but that seems like a <laughs> pretty weird way to change the amplification so if you look at that uh, knob way over on the right that says amplifier, uh, and you look at what it does, that pot, you see that it um, it varies R1 in the circuit diagram down there. And all that R1 does is change the voltage on the uh, second um, RF stage there uh, and change the uh, the amplifier gain of that. 
I sort of expected that Amplifier would be over on the right at the audio stuff, but uh, no such <laughs> luck. <laughs> there, there aren't any R's over there in those last three tubes to change. I know it. I know <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. It's just the, the circuit diagram struck me as being very, very strange. What I'd like to do, um, Len, if it's okay with you, is I would like to read the instructions for tuning the receiver and as I read them, we can see what is being done electrically in the circuit. Before I do that, do you have any uh, comments that you want to make, Len? It's funny you say that about the circuit, because when I first got this, I had Bob Merriam from the Wigan Wireless and Sea Museum come over to my house. And I had the radio hooked up to a battery eliminator. And I had it running. And he looked at that circuit and he said, there's no way this will work. <laughs> of course, the thing's sitting there playing while he's saying this, but he didn't understand the circuit at all. He's just, it was just foreign to him. I think that's what caught my interest, too. I didn't understand the circuit at all. Now, Bob Merriam was a wonderful guy. I don't know how many of you knew him, but he, I guess, pretty much single handedly built the Rhode Island Museum of Wireless and Steam and collected a lot of stuff. And uh, he had a yeah. secret little room down in the basement that he didn't tell anybody about, even the employees. And I caught him one time. I had a radio that he just was ready to kill for. He wanted it so badly. And I said, well, Bob, I know you got something you'll trade me for it. And he said, don't tell anybody. And he took me down in the basement and there was a, a killer telegraph key that was just so incredibly rare that I couldn't resist. <laughs> and he said, don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody. But now that he's passed on, I think I can give away the secret. <laughs> what a wonderful guy. He and his wife were just such happy people. That's uh, no, very that's interesting. Sure. Well, I, yeah, uh, it looks like, I mean, it looks like the... Both R1 and R2 are just affecting filament voltage. Yes, I, yep. I think that's yeah. true. And um, uh, let me see. I, I think I thought maybe one of them um, was affecting several several filaments, but it doesn't look that way. I think that they are they're uh, independent there. Okay. Anyway, um, anything else to say? Um, Len, before I uh, read the instructions on how to tune this thing and we go through it? No, not really, no. Uh, okay, so what I'd like you to do is follow along with me. I'm going to read the instructions that were on that sheet of paper that I showed you, and we'll see if it makes any sense, okay? It says two rheostats are used. Rheostat R1 controls all of the amplifier tubes, and rheostat R3 controls the detector tubes. So we look down at rheostat R1, and all I see it doing is um, um, varying the voltage on the second tube there. Um, yeah. uh, the, uh, it looks like rheostat R2 is necessary to change the detector gain. You're missing a schematic dot of R1 onto the rest of them. Say again. I think there's a dot on the schematic. It's a uh, R1 controls all five tubes. Oh, yeah, you okay. See, you see that? Yeah, I see the same thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, that little um, connection right above the squiggly resistor shows right. that. That's what I thought. Oh, yeah. I spotted that and then I forgot it. <laughs> okay, so R1 then, uh, uh, let's go back. Rheostat R1 controls all of the amplifier tubes. Now, has anyone else seen uh, pots being used to control the gain of a tube? Is that common? I'm not familiar enough with this. That was very you common mean, back then. You mean by controlling the filament voltage? Yes, right. Does that, uh, in order to control the gain of the tube, you vary the filament voltage? Is that a common thing to do? I wouldn't think so, but in those days, the filament voltage had an awful lot to do with how well the tube performed. Yeah, yeah. more well, emissions, that, more that was heat. That, that was actually That's very right. common back then. It, it was, was common. Yes. It get more electrons flowing. 
Yeah, well, it makes sense logically, but I, I don't think I've ever seen it, or maybe I just didn't look closely enough at the schematics. Well, I have. A, I, I recently wrote an article in Electric Radio Magazine addressing this problem, ah. in that I um, many of the earlier tube testers and the later tube testers, they didn't have transformers that would supply, for instance the two and a half amps for a type 45 tube <laughs> and the wiring wasn't sufficient so that when you drew two and a half amps, the, you got quite a voltage drop on, on, on the tube. So the tube may have been running at two volts or, you know, it may have not had the full two and a half amps of current. Uh -huh. And that causes the, the, the GM, the transconductance of the tube to do of the tube to decrease quite quite rapidly, and uh, in those older tubes, that's a real problem with them. So what I had done in that electric radio magazine, I had devised a a GM tester and monitored the filament current, filament voltage, and plate voltage and grid voltage, and plate current as well, and I had stabilized plate voltage. So. The transconductant numbers that I were getting were very accurate using that method. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you very much for that education. I appreciate it. Let me yeah, go on. Having the resistor, the rheostat there, not only helps you, allows you to change the game, but it also compensates for a dying battery. <laughs> True. That's, that's, right. that's, that's very right. Yep. And maybe maybe even compensates for a dying tube too, as the emission decreases. If you heat it up a little more, it'll probably yep. emit more. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we'll go back to the introductions. <clears throat> Two rheostats are used. Rheostat R1 controls all the amplifier tubes. Rheostat R3 controls the detector tubes. It is recommended that I, I love this all the way through these instructions. Um, the guy is talking about why he chose specific parts for the radio. There's about a whole page there, why he chose a, a 10K instead of a 15K resistor and so on uh, as part of this write-up. Okay, moving on. In the case of the resistance of the rheostat R1 um, should be 6 ohms, and the resistance of R3 should be 15 ohms. Um, the resistance of the potentiometer P, which is the guy way over on the left that looks like it's varying the, um, uh, the plate voltage on the, um, uh, uh, first, looks like a first amplifier tube, first RF on the left. Um, what does he say? The resistance of the potentiometer P can be either 200 or 400 ohms. I, I find it very funny that he's writing all this here. He, he's producing and selling a radio with a particular um, value on his resistors. And in the instructions, he's saying, well, you can either use a 200 or 400 ohm resistor. Finer regulation is obtained with a 400 ohm potentiometer. However, the 200 ohm potentiometer can be used successfully. <laughs> the variable condenser should be of the low loss type to obtain sharper tuning. And then it says the A battery should be in the form of a storage battery. Any standard six volt storage body will give satisfactory results. The B battery should be two 22 and a half volt blocks or it can be a 45 volt block with a 22 and a half volt tap. Now we go on to the really interesting stuff, I think. The operation of the set is not difficult, he says. The two main controls are the variable condenser and the potentiometer, which I assume are the two way over on the left there. To start operating the set, turn the point of the stabilizer in a counterclockwise direction as far as it can go, then turn the rheostat controlling the amplifier tubes in a clockwise direction to a point three quarters of the way around. That's the one we know that controls the filaments of the amplifier. At this time, five tubes should be lighted. 
Can you imagine a, a user, somebody who knows nothing about radio, trying to follow these directions? <laughs> At this time, oh, five yeah. tubes, five tubes should be lighted. The first two from the left and the last two from the right. That's only two, as far, only four, four as far as I can tell. <laughs> At this point, time, five tubes should be lighted. The first two from the left and the last two from the right. Insert that that the was phone. a that <laughs> was a cut that was a cut and paste error, but they didn't have <laughs> cut and paste back then. Probably <laughs> the last three on the right, I'm guessing. But no, I, I think that's yeah. a very reasonable assumption. Yeah. <laughs> Insert no, no, the, no, no, that, that's just the uh, the first application of modern math. <laughs> okay, <laughs> modern math, right? Yeah. Set theory, fuzzy math. <laughs> Insert the phones or the loudspeaker into the jack or the loudspeaker binding posts. Turn the rheostat controlling the detector in a clockwise direction to a point until you hear a pronounced hiss or frying music. <laughs> frying music, I love it. <laughs> when you hear this hiss, turn up rheostat, turn up rheostat back very slightly until the hiss just disappears. To tune yeah. in the station, turn the stabilizer or potentiometer in a clockwise direction about three quarters of the way around, then turn the variable condenser very slowly. If stations are broadcasting, you will hear their carrier wave whistle at various points as the condenser is rotated. It there sounds like a, you're setting up signal to noise ratio, right? At that yeah. point. Yeah, you got that detector just on the brink of regeneration. Absolutely. Yep. Right, right. But um there is a neutral point in this whistle <laughs> where the speech and music will be heard. So that, that whistle is the regen point. When you hear the voice or music, retard the potentiometer very slowly until the station comes in loud and clear. After the station has been tuned in, move the loop very slowly until you reach a point where the signals are coming in very loudly. Make note of these dial settings and use these settings when tuning the set again. Under test, the Giblin receiver performed well with the loop as a five tube set using an outdoor antenna. I think he means as well or something like that. As well with the loop as a set using an outdoor antenna. Distant stations were brought in with ease and the volume was sufficient to operate a loudspeaker. End of instructions. <laughs> now that's just wonderful, Len. I, I think those instructions are uh, classic. <laughs> And I, I just don't see how people, normal people, could follow them and understand what they were doing. <laughs> well, this, incredible. Well, what's what's the time frame of this? What was the year? Yeah, it looks like 1924. I think. Yeah. I read. So I mean, there, yeah. there weren't, yeah. you know, there weren't any normal people trying to <laughs> dabble in radio in the 1920s. <laughs> no. And and not only that, they didn't have any tool manuals or anything. Yeah. Len, and do you have any idea how much this thing cost in those days? Was it a real expensive set? I found ads for it. But off the top of my head, I don't remember, but I was like moderately priced. It wasn't real expensive. No. Yeah. I guess for those days it was, but. Mm. Yeah. Well, the good news, have, the good have news to look is there weren't up. a lot of components in there, like a lot of, you know, capacitors resistors and things like that right. but there One were but but there were what one two three four five transformers that could potentially give you a bad time if they failed or open windings or whatever yeah and they well, add to they add to the cost of making the thing too right yeah they had real fine wire in those transformers in those days also. Okay. Yeah. At least, at least one the of them. Did it. What's that? The knobs did it. Yeah. 
At I've least one of, the, one of the transformers <laughs> has a condenser uh, the uh, by the detector there. So at least the secondary winding of that's probably not going to burn up, but the others could easily. Mm -hmm. They're right in the plate circuit of the uh, oh, tubes so. or in the in the grid. Yeah. <laughs> now, unfortunately, that C2, I have no knowledge of this radio whatsoever. I'm just going with... Um... <laughs> You know, the, what could possibly go wrong? C2 is a silver mica capacitor, and this is the first instance of silver mica disease. They would show up right there in that <laughs> trench. There we go. I've got a question. Go ahead. Um, I noticed on the bottom there, the outlet company, Providence, Rhode Island, just curious, yeah. are they the manufacturer? Or are they just the seller? They were the dealer. They were the dealer. Okay. Yeah, no, that was a department store in Providence. Right. They had a big right. radio section. Right. And they, they also, actually also they also ran WJAR radio. Yeah, right. That's what I was gonna, That's right. yeah. Yeah. I was gonna say. They they operated WJAR. Uh just curious. No, the manufacturer was called the Standard Radio and Electric Company. Okay. In uh Pawtucket. Right. Yeah. I actually have two other Giblin radios that have this exact same chassis in it. Different case, you know, different case configuration, but it's the exact same chassis. Hmm. How's the 201 take to uh, uh, filament voltage being at, at its maximum level? Um, is the filament in a 201 fairly durable? Anybody fill, fiddle with them? What's that again? The 201? The, the 201 tube. I'm just wondering if messing with the filament voltage like this might oh, yeah. make them yeah, burn what, out more rapidly. Yeah, what there's a whole series of articles written in in the wireless magazines and uh, antique wireless and a whole bunch of others on tube regeneration. Mm. And oh, it was yeah. all in, in burning off the coating on the filament that would collect. Yeah, right. They did that with picture tubes. As, as exactly. I, I was just going to say that. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so it's kind of like gain bandwidth product. You know, you can listen to a really distant station, but only for a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to change the tubes, of course. <laughs> anyway, Len, thank you for this. Uh, it's um, an amazing set and uh, uh, certainly pretty uh, darn amusing. <laughs> Where, where, do you, a, where, do you a, in, where do you plug in? Where do you hook up the iPod? Is what I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I have I a question for Glenn. Glenn, where are you located? Len. Glenn, where well, are you? I'm in, I'm, I I live in North Providence. Okay. Okay. I I believe I've met you at the uh, Wireless Museum. Oh, that's probably true. I'm down there a lot. So yeah. yeah. I'm going to be going there on Thursday. Oh, are you? Yeah, the uh, Fidelity Radio Club with WI1I oh, yeah, yep. and myself are going to uh, we're going to uh, uh, do the CQ160 out of there. Oh, oh, Fun. that's good. Yeah, we have a 500 foot long wire there right now. Great. <laughs> that's great. When nobody's looking, you can put the Massey Spark Station on the air. <laughs> well, yeah, but that'll shut down everything in the whole state. So yeah, well, you win the contest. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, by so the way, be before we leave this, I, I have like the dumb kid question here. It's like, it, what was the reason for, I mean, if, if you went forward a decade or two or three from this design, you would have coupling capacitors between each stage of amplification as opposed to a much more complicated thing like a transformer in between each stage. Um, well, is it, is it just I, where I we answer, were? I can answer that question for you. You notice that there's no such thing as RC coupling in any of these old radios. Right. They, didn't know, they didn't know what RC coupling was, and the bias voltage on these tubes varied so much in the early manufacturing that what they had to do was almost every radio had to be custom adjusted. 
Okay. No, that yeah, that, that, that makes sense. I'm just yep. Wow. Wow. This was well. This is terrific, Tom and Len. That was great. Yeah. Well, Appreciate thank you, Len. That. Len Len brought this thing to our attention. Really, we never would have seen it without him. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Plus, appreciate the walkthrough of just, you know, the. Well, yeah, the thank you for sky. digging into this, Tom. <laughs> it's such a fun set. I, I, one of these days, I'm going to show up on your doorstep and say, Can I please play with it? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you give him enough notice so you get some good, you know, calamari with the pepperoncinos or some. <laughs> uh, some chorice as opposed to chorizo or you know we call it chorizo in texas i think it's chorice in rhode island yeah um, maybe we maybe we can talk glenn into bringing it to uh, brookline and we can all try tuning it <laughs> we we could put an antenna they wouldn't notice if we put a hundred foot antenna up on that building <laughs> <would> they? <laughs> Oh, especially you got the loop i forgot we don't need it yeah we won't That's need right. it no and well and with the power being put out by today's radio stations, you probably don't need it at all. So. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, and don't can, forget to it, wear your boots. Because <laughs> you got to walk down the street <laughs> with the end of the antenna wire. Yeah, bring a bring a bring a snow shovel. <laughs> you know, I, I I remember talking to my father about my father was an electrician, an an early electrician. He used to work for the Kellogg Corporation back in the 20s and uh, he used to travel all over the country putting in power power systems you know for them and he dabbled a little while in making radios and he used to tell me how some of the things he used to do uh you know mostly these were crystal sets yeah cat's whiskers yeah cat's whiskers and uh, he used to um uh, he used to build these things for people in the town of Warren. I, I, I live in Rhode Island, so I'm pretty familiar with what's going, with everything you're saying here. But but he told me back in those days, there were hundreds of people building radios in Rhode Island. Oh, yeah, definitely. Hundreds. Yeah, I mean, they, I mean it, and they range from like, you know, people building them in their house up to factories. Yep. Yeah, it was it was there was a lot a lot of radio in Rhode Island. Yep. yep. And of course, they made Sesco tubes here in Rhode Island, and uh, um, and Triad too. And Triad, yep. 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 I'm just curious. When did uh, KDKA come on the air? I and mean, they were really the first broadcaster. Yeah, Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. If you got to watch that series. Um... Was it Greg? I don't know. When I get confused. I'm in too many clubs now. But the that five part series that came out about radio collectors that was on PBS yeah. in the 1980s that was fantastic. And it it answers all these questions about the early days of radio and KDKA in Pittsburgh. And it, it was it was a great great way well, to spend some time. There's a station operating out of Newport, which is one of the longest continuous operating. AM stations in the country. Really? Yeah. What station is that? What's that? What's the uh, what's the call letters? I think it's W A D something. W S A D? No, A D something. Oh. Hmm. It doesn't ring a bell. Interesting. Yeah. That, but that... The, I'll 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 do a little more research on it, but I noticed that um I had heard a talk about that not too long ago and that they were addressing it. And it was one of the very first stations to go on the air in Rhode Island mm -hmm. and, and, and the entire country for that matter. And WJIR, by the way, was came on the air in the, I think around 1921. Right, and, and actually Giblin built that station. All the equipment yeah. was built by him. Mm -hmm. oh. But most of these time, most of the time, these guys do not operate continuous. They would come on for like maybe one or two hours a day. Mm. Right, or right. Night. Yep. Great. Well, thank you guys. This is excellent. Excellent presentation. Yeah. Very informative. Cool. Right. Okay. Moving right along, we have 
pictures and some show and tell items from Greg will, um, from the uh, Wisconsin Integrio Club. Well, they had a recent, I'll, I'll let Greg fill in the details, but it was a recent event in January, but uh, but uh, there weren't any pictures to share and Greg will explain, uh. <laughs> Greg will explain why. And uh, But we can revert to uh, pictures from the November event, which we never got a chance to look at anyway. Um, so I will share those, but I'll let Greg give a maybe a little background what happened in January, and then we'll share the November photos. And Greg also has some of his acquisitions between the two events, being the stalwart that he is. <laughs> uh, well, so. our January meet, we had a just the, the worst weather the week leading up to that meet on Sunday. We had uh, let's see six inches of snow on Tuesday, and we got fourteen inches of snow on Friday. Another three inches of snow on Saturday, and there was another inch to wake up to on Sunday, the day of the meet. So needless to say, by that time, the temperature dropped. It was only about four degrees that morning. So we got to New Berlin, where the meet was held. Half the town was without power yet. They didn't have power until, I think it was this past Tuesday. So luckily, the venue had power and had heat, but only three vendors showed up. So that's why they didn't take any pictures. There was like uh, maybe about wow. four radios total at the meet, mostly parts. For our November meet, we had a, a pretty good turnout. That was held in Racine at the at the place called the Racine Kennel Club in Racine, Wisconsin. And those of you who are fans of old time radio shows might remember that Trimmer McGee and Molly was sponsored oh, sure. by Johnson's Wax, and they were Johnson's Wax was based in Racine, Wisconsin. Just to put a little twist on that. But when you get to the pictures, here they come. Yep, they're coming right up here. Why is this doing what it's doing? I chose, despite what I chose, try that <laughs> again. I, I know I chose the right window. Let's try one more time. It seems insistent. Try this. All right, is that better? There we go. Yep. There yes. we go. I don't know. Uh, Zoom decided it knew better despite my choice. <laughs> well, this, this event was held at a place called the Racine Kennel Club, which is actually a big building that they train dogs, obedience training for dogs, and the place had a rubber floor inside the building there. Kind of a, a first time we were at that venue, it's kind of off the beaten path, but that's a an Atwater Kent, I believe, and it's got the timer on the side where you can uh, set yeah, it for different programs. That's amazing. Is yeah. that cool? For, for a table model. And, and the guy had a good price on it. I think he wanted like $2,500 for it, which probably was, was worth it because it's a rare set. But Is that one of those ones where it has like little cords that pull out? That I plug? think it might. I, I never really got to see how it worked. Yeah, I, yeah, I think you pulled out these little plugs with cords on the end to... And you would not only pick what time it went on and off, but what time it would change stations. And it was right. amazing. Yeah. There was one of those in that video series, the five part series. Oh, was that right? Yeah. A, a very early analog computer. Exactly. Yeah. You could set it, it would change stations too. If, if you wanted mm -hmm. to listen to Amos and Andy at one time, you could. Yep. And then after that, you had Kate Smith or something. You could tune a different station for that. <laughs> mm -hmm. we, we, I mean, the the amazing thing is, is there probably weren't that many choices. <laughs> no, back no. Then. Yeah, probably not. Probably not. They're attractive looking. Yeah, radio, that was, that was a beautiful. Set. That was right inside the door. The first thing you walked in the building, that's the first thing you saw. So, it kind of grabbed everybody's well, attention. This is from maybe the early. Didn't in the early days of radio, the stations were like 10 KC apart, and then they wanted to fit in more stations, so they reduced the fidelity and made them 5 KC apart. <laughs> it's possible. It's possible. I did, I but I don't I know. If you, if you if that was the first radio you saw and you really wanted it and bought it, then you could just turn around and go home because you'd be out of money. <laughs> <laughs> you'd be out of money. <laughs> <work. yet. laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think we were talking about the, the first, first station at KDKA. Then that started in Pittsburgh in 1920, because I think uh, yes, somewhere around there. But yeah, well, it was definitely it, Pittsburgh, and it was somewhere around 1920. I, yeah. I, I did a quick Google on that. It was November 19, or, or excuse me, 
Yeah, November 1920 is when they first went on the air. Okay. Because last year, WGN in Chicago just celebrated their 100th uh, anniversary. So that would have been 1922. They went on the air. Please, what do we have here? This is a Philco. It's big Philco, yeah. Huge tombstone. It took up a lot of real estate. I think we got the shadow meter. Almost looks the size of a uh, washing machine or dryer. <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't far off. You need a big table. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think it's a nineteen thirty-seven, a thirty-seven dash something. I forget what the model number is. It's it's a nice a, set. Attractive looking set. I mean, the woodwork is all very nice. Mm -hmm. It's got the shadow meter, which has it. Nice touch. I think it was last year, 37, 38 was the last year they had the shadow meter. Philco never little, went from high to they just a little odd little deco. Oh. What's the what's the date on that radio? I believe it's the 1937. Yeah, that's, that's funny. Deco theory. Yep. Interesting. I would have thought it was a little earlier than that by you know, yeah. that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's when they started doing the different contrast in woods and things like that, various yeah. different right. materials. Different veneers. Yeah, that's no, quite quite nice. It's basically a, a, a table, a council and a table model. Right. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of those radios, they had just huge table models and basically it was a, a, a chassis out of a council they just used a smaller speaker. And you lift up the top, the top is hinged, so you can put your clothes in for drying. <laughs> Actually, the RCA had a tombstone like that, that the top did lift up when there was a record player in it. Ah, uh -huh, <laughs> right. Yeah. About that same era, 37, 36. That's one that followed me home. That's yeah. a little Radio. specific. Uh, brand it's off brand but it's a, a plascon set little table model and uh maybe you're familiar with plascon cabinets i mean they're, they're almost translucent when the the tubes light up and the dial light if you turn the lights out in the room the thing looks like it's on fire because it glows inside oh, that's cool have you have you taken a nighttime photo of it yet greg there is one in the the pictures i sent beyond this in fact the radio is just above my head here yes <laughs> that 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 Rhode Island radio we uh, talked about first would do the same thing depending upon how, where you put the rheostat. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I bet it would. <laughs> it's, a, it's a compact little radio, but it's got an eye tube in it. It's kind of unique. Yeah, I, I was impressed by the, the, the level of the extra goodies they put in for a small radio like that. Very attractive yeah. looking video. Is that one the, the same guy that had the Atwater Kent inside the door? The next picture is uh, had this big set too. He just had some really amazingly restored high end sets for sale. But I don't think any of them, uh, I think he took them all back home with him again. I think that might be an Atwater too. Or... No, it wasn't Atwater. I forget what the brand was on that one. It's got a very unusual cabinet. To... Yeah, look at the stacking. Beautiful, beautiful stack of wood like that. The grill work is kind of unique too. It yeah. almost looks like it's got a treble clef in there or something. Yeah. Yeah, very attractive. I mean, the woodwork alone is really beautiful. Even like, you know, you know you look up close here, it's just really very attractive. Just, just the cabinet alone is worth the experience. Yeah. Yeah, I love about the same size as that Philco out, outside there that you saw. Little... Yeah, yeah, for sure. Another lift up top, you know, to dry your clothes. <laughs> Put your wash in there. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Combine washer and radio. Yeah. Now, what do we have here? Nice little RCA. Oh, okay. Nice. Nice. I'm assuming it must have a must have a jack on it somewhere there to plug in the little forty five RPM record player. I believe it did. Yeah. No, those were nice little sets. They had a. Yeah, the, the dial is actually a piece of glass that's bent like that. It's not that's plastic. interesting. Really? Huh. Yeah. And I worked on one like that once, and it lights up really pretty. It's, it's, it's side lit, and it kind of goes right through the glass. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, it must be very nice. I also like the the bent uh, dial indicator. Yeah, the dial indicator is bent to match the glass. Yeah, that's really simply done. A real joy to redo the dial string. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Oh, look at this. There's the guy's whole table. There he's got the, the Atwater on the end, and those are the other oh, ones. Oh, the bar radio. Oh. Bar radio. You know, yeah. Hey, yeah, hey, Noah, I don't know if it's still for sale now. Bruce has one on, on eBay. Well, you kind of lose me after you say Bruce and eBay. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this one here had most of the glass work with it too. Yeah, his things. is his is as complete as I've seen. You know, yeah. I've got plenty of really nice glassware with like etching of, and all says Jack Daniels on it and all that. Yeah. I just I just need the I don't really need the glassware as much as I need the unit. Yeah, there you go. You can supply the booze and the glasses. You just need the radio. <laughs> nice yeah, piece funny, yeah the, if, unlike any other piece of electronics I own. Yeah, the, the booze costs more than the radio. <laughs> That's the white radio ever, with a handle. That was a... Uh, it's an off There's an Arvin. Arvin, yeah. Calling Lloyd Spivey. Yeah, that... that uh, I haven't seen that one. They're usually brown. Yeah. Nice, nice handle. Very, uh, yeah. very attractive. That's actually right. a really good performance. Is that, too. Hey, is that still available? <laughs> Anybody know? That, that, one, that one I brought home with me. <laughs> oh, wow. There you go. <laughs> I, just, I couldn't remember what the brand was, though. That's a Motorola on, on the left. Motorola? Yeah. What a neat looking uh, uh, dial face. Does that light up? That must look cool. Yeah, I think it does. He's just a little, you know, good cleanup. It looks all complete. Yeah, the little white one was about the only one in my price range on that guy's table. Everything he had was pretty pricey. That brown one should be uh, like autographed by Sigourney Weaver or something. It looks like Alien. <laughs> <something>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's different. I never saw one like that before. Yeah, that's very unusual. I like the Arvin. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oops, you know what? Maybe let's back off this. I'm having trouble having it go uh, zoom in. It zooms out fine. Oh, there you go. Yeah. But, you know, it, it's, it's a little like, Philco tombstone right there that you've got your mouse on. I think it's about a 36. You know, I'm sorry, it's not a. That's a that's in a, a GE, the GE tombstone. This one right here, the left of that one. Oh, okay, one. yeah, okay, yeah. That because I thought we just covered that. Yeah, yeah. That's a GE, a thirty-six. And the one to the left of that is an Emerson. Yeah, that's very nice. That Emerson, very attractive mm -hmm. radio. Nice What's course. that radio to the left of the bullet radio? The left of the bullet radio. That one I don't. Oh, in front of the Atwater can. I guess. Showing that I can tell what it is anymore. I'll try and zoom in. I don't know if I'm going to get a little bit more detail there. Boy, it's right at the edge of, if we had more yeah. of a dial face, maybe. You know, I think that was like a Firestone. Maybe. Right? Because it had an Ingram cabinet. That's a beautiful cabinet. Look at the woodwork. Like the... Uh, the strip at the top there in the first half inch or so. Uh, Where the rubber yeah. meets the road. Yeah, even the bottom. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's quite yeah, that's what that was. That was, that was a Firestone. There we got a famous movie yeah. dial. Yeah, we get a mixed bag. And a coin collection, I think. Yeah, so we had the coin collection there. Where do we black collect? plastic stuff? That's the airline movie dial. This one here, oh yes, yes indeed. Mm -hmm. yes, indeed. That's that's. And actually, was a, actually was a battery set that he had converted because that little button down there is for lighting the dial. Because when you turned it on, it didn't keep the bulb on all the time, but it would have drained your battery down right away. Ah, she had to push the button in the middle. 
It'll push the button to light the dial. Yeah. And normally, and normally open switch, and you had to hold it down. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Okay. I wonder what that portable is though on top of there. Yeah, we can zoom in on that one. That's what we got. What is that? Our, that our, five is, letters. R E F L A. Am I, am I reading that correctly? Hmm. Okay. Ruffla? Yeah, Are you talking about Ruffla? the transitone? Transitone because up at the top. Yeah. This one here. Yeah. yeah. Well, it says transitone right at the top. That doesn't could it? be a filter. Transistors. But it doesn't look it like says transistors. That's why. Uh, oh, yeah, transistors. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, transistors. So, but it's interesting. It says, you know, we're running, let's see if I can dial. I wonder if I can. I think the unfortunate thing is it. this is kind of like, I think I see it as R E F L A. I mean, yeah, it was an off brand. I... No, that would be RTFMA. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Is that an acronym? Beats the heck out of me. Yes, it is. It's a very well known acronym. <laughs> <laughs> This, this vendor here, he caused quite a stir at that meet because uh, he bought a set from one of the other vendors. And he, he gave him a set, Bob's story. Oh, I've only got a hundred dollars, though. You know, and so the guy finally relinquished and sold it to him. He took it over to his table and put it on there and put a different price on it. <laughs> I think somebody, I think somebody was catching a little bit of feedback in there. I perform. You know, I, I saw an HRO, a note of HRO up at um, Near Fest one time. And uh, we had got there on Friday. Sounds like a TV in the background somewhere. Yeah, so somebody somebody running a um it's like I, I can unshare and see if I can find the mic the, the mic might be. There we go. It's quiet now. Nope. Nope. Oh, you know, that might be my wife in the other room. Ah. Uh, Let me go close the door. Oh, okay. Thanks, Rob. Um, but me, Bob. See if that makes a difference. Can't you just not be back? I just unmute myself in between ridiculous comments. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That makes a difference there. See if we'll wait for Rob to come back. There's a little Philco yeah. cathedral in the back here. It's about model 89, I think. Was that oh, it? Right there. Yeah, that's a Philco. No, I think we still have it. Yeah. Well, I think I closed the door and she turned the volume down. So maybe it's not. Uh... Let me see. I'm just going to quickly stop share and see if I can catch it on. I can't see the participants, uh, but I can sometimes see whose microphone is. Can't be me because I'm all alone. I'm just going to try something. Don't mind me if I just. It's Tom's fault. <laughs> Maybe it's it's all in our heads. It's a it's a it's a worm, an earworm. Every time I see Tom, I think I'm watching The Wizard of Oz because, like, most everything's in black and white, but he's in color. Yeah. <laughs> that is weird. Thank you. Oh, there it is. Someone got it. No. Oh. Oh. <laughs> that is weird because usually I can see a. Um, well, I'm going to check. Wow. Did I get it? It was Tom. Wow, Tom, that was weird. You have some strange feedback? You got, no, you just had that porn channel on. That was... Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, Antique I radio turn, porn? Well, okay. You know, anything I'm going to turn my mic off here. Tell me if it goes away. You won't hear me. No, no, right. Rob, you're, you're fine. Everything is... Um, we seem, right. to, seem to get some, some yeah. strange feedback. It's an enigma. Yeah. It's an enigma machine. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's funny. That, or they, it's oh, that yeah. Goonie box that Tom has in the background there. Uh, All right. So I think we're back to where we left off. Yes, yep. indeed. So there was, I think you were saying there's a Philco there, Greg, in the yep. upper that's left the corner. corner. Yeah, in the very upper corner there. Yeah, that's a, I think a model 60. Very common one. Yeah, there it is. There it is. <laughs> Speak of the devil. Yeah, it's nice looking. This is a nice looking set. Um, maybe they all the knobs look clean. Wow. Nice job. Mm -hmm. They're nice sets. The only problem with those is just about every one I've ever encountered a Model 60 or a 66 or an 89, they've all got to have coils rewound. Yeah. Thanks for the warning. Yeah. <laughs> Just in case you meet a neighbor with one there, Noah. Well, I, you know, I wish he had told me about the rubber wire before I opened my mouth about Ooh. the neighbor's radio. <laughs> that, that was a wire. That boy, that man, I'll tell you, I have seen some basket cases on that. Ooh. Yes, indeed. It was a freaking nightmare. Do you know that the RCA ACR 111, the entire tuna chassis was wired with rubber wire? I believe that, yeah. And when I had gotten that radio, I mean, it was just a mass of bare wires because that rubber wire had dried up so sure. much mm -hmm. that it just all fell off, and there was a big pile of different colored little pieces of rubber in the in the bottom of the chassis. Bomb in the radio looked like the bomb of a fish tank, almost yeah. a half an inch deep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's fine. I had to I had to rewire that entire RF tuna section. <laughs> well, you don't have to rewire all of it. You just have to put in that inline fuse I was asking about before. That's <laughs> 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 funny. Well, I think most of your rubber wiring was just in those tuner buttons, the tone buttons on the Oh, yeah, no, it somebody, was, but there, well, there was, but uh, there, there were some other yeah, things. Some I of mean, the early these, silver tones had it. There were yeah. these really long yellow wires that just went up to just the two stupid light bulbs, you know. They, yeah, those two. It's always the light bulbs and the push buttons. Yep. That thing, I forget what brand that was. That's got a Zenith. Just a pilot. Pilot. There you go. Look at that. Oh, right the night radios. Right, a nice looking uh, dial face. Yeah. Yeah. I love those airplane dials thing. Yeah. That was a huge set, too. That took up a half a table. Oh, okay. Yeah. Boy, I'll tell you, for a size, you'd almost say, geez, you thought they would have put a, a, a tuning eye on that. Feels like it's missing that just with its big size. It was about still, the size of the Still smaller than a console. Yes, well, I was just going to say, if you cut the top half off of a console, that's about how big that radio went. Yeah, I bet. That's game radio, though. Yeah. Okay, got here. A couple of unusual radios. Yeah, that one's a. What's that say? Uh, is it Atna? Is that? Or oh, it's hard um, to. That. Yeah, it might be an Atna, A E T N A. That might be it. It's just oh, hard to see. There's enough crud around the letters. It's a little bit hard to tell. I know I didn't look too close at it because unfortunately the dial face has got a big old hole in it there. Which is... Yeah, I was wondering what was going on there. So it's actually rather, look at that handle. I have to admit, it is quite the fancy handle on it. Yeah, as <laughs> usual. There's one of those headboard radios with the, the night light on it. Oh, it's right. a Mitch, Mitchell Lullaby. Yeah. Yeah. I think Noah had one of those at one time. I know Noah was looking for a lens for one at one time. Yeah. A couple of tube yes. testers. Oh, tube testers. Yeah. Yeah, the one on the left is my go-to. I think they're both Precision. Yeah. That's the brand. Mm -hmm. yep. I've seen them. It's a good test here. I like it because you can test all the early tubes in it. 
Yeah. It's hard to, hard to find a tester that'll do the full four pin, like the number 20, 27s. It yeah. certainly is. But then again, it's one of those, well, you know what? Maybe I'll just not get any more of those radios with four pin tubes. <laughs> yeah. That's another way to solve it. Yeah. Until one comes out of your bench and you wonder how it got there. Unfortunately, those are all just plain emission testers. I know. Yeah, I, I like the one like the Hickox that measured G sub M, you know. Yep. Yeah. Especially if you're doing like audio amplifiers and you actually want to try to match tubes for a push pull output stage. Sure. Oh yeah. I, I've yeah, got I a couple of Hickox and they still have the nice same, They still have the same problem where they can't do a 45. So I, I actually have another tester that I use, it, but it's an emission tester. That's the only way I can really right. check a 45. I, I check a 45 with my handheld, you know, just ohm meter. If the filament's good, chances are the tube's okay. <laughs> the yeah. 45s, it seems like if, if the filament's open, okay, you're all done. You don't really have to care what the rest of it's all about. That's true, because weak 45s still work. That's yeah. Right. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not trying to like you know, week blow the, door, blow the doors out of a theater or anything. Yeah, but I I go to events where I sell tubes and I get people that are like you know, they're hammering me to death about forty fives and I'm like, well, this is what it is. You take it or leave it. Yep. Yeah, I'll yeah. I'll 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 do a thorough test on it for you for two hundred and fifty dollars. Otherwise, go away. <laughs> yeah, I'll send it off to the lab and I'll get back to you and then you can pay my three hundred dollar bill when I'm done. Exactly. Well, you know that that project that I embarked on with the the GM tube tester that I had told you about earlier was all because I I have a five thirty nine C Hickok, and what I would do is is I would uh, measure. I had an adapter that I plugged forty fives into, and I would actually crank up the line voltage until I had the right voltage and the right current on the 45 and then and then i would test the gm and yep. uh, and i got you know i got good numbers but then i would send this tube off to, to someone okay and they would get it and they would say oh this tube's a dud right? very low emission very low and i would say fine send it back i'll refund your money and i got tired of doing that <laughs> yep I had an RCA radio 66 that for about four years, it, it, it sounds stupid, but I would, this was a long time ago when I was even, not only was I younger, but even more stupid than I am now. Um, <laughs> I just, I couldn't come up with a type 80 rectifier. So for about four years, I ran that set with a 5U4 laying on its side <laughs> with just the four <laughs> appropriate pins plugged in to the four holes in the type 80 socket and it worked just fine so yep. it was like i know it was drawing a little too much current for the transformer but i never burned it out because i you know it's not like i was playing it 10 hours a day and and, and it was fine yeah a rectifier is a rectifier but it's a rectifier right you know, i've seen very very few rectifiers where they just didn't work at all very few. Yeah, there's actually two of those headboard radios. Yeah, this one's a pretty nice shape. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm going to have to call it that. You think that guy who does the dial faces, does he uh, maybe do those little white lenses up on the top? Because I've got a, I have a couple of these radios and they're both, they, they have the long light bulb that still works, mm -hmm. but they don't have the lenses. I would think you could try him, Mark Palmquist. He does all the dial covers and that. He might have some material, at least, that you didn't have the actual cover, some material that you could use to make one. Mm. Who is this guy? It's Mark his Palmquist. dial dialcovers.com, I think is his website, isn't it? Yes. Yes, dialcovers.com. Amazing. Dialcovers He's a great guy. Mm -hmm. And I it's, think... I mean, you know, this the stuff's basically made of unobtainium. I mean, you know, you can't go find a, you know, a real dial face for a 1940 radio. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so he could probably, you know, 
he could probably charge more than what he charges for them. I mean, he's usually in the order of about 20 bucks. Yeah. You know, and how you how are you gonna how are you gonna do that on your own for $20 yeah. and you're never gonna find one. Right. I think that's I think I think I might have had him make me the new dial covers for the ACR one eleven. Yeah. When I did it. I know I had somebody and uh he just I told him what I needed and lo and behold he he made them for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that was a basket case zenith there. That was actually a farm set. And it was just, I wish you would have taken a picture of the back set because it was just roached. It was. Uh, well, that might have taken you two weeks instead of one week to be, be perfect. At least, yeah. No, you would have made a power supply for that one. There, There's the set that the guy bought the, off of this guy's table and put it back on his table. <laughs> You're kidding. Wow. No. Flipping in your face, flipping. In I've seen that in flip. Coach Town. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's why you don't pay for fair. somebody for $10. He brings it over his table. He has a $75 tag on it. You yeah. know what? I mean, I'm, that's how I made my living at, at car swap meets. I was the guy who sold the stuff for 10 or 15 or $20, but I didn't have to carry it home. Exactly. And I sold it to guys who put it in their space at like a hundred dollars and then wound up not selling it and had to drag it all the way home. Yeah. So, you know, that's what happened with this one. He didn't sell it at the meet. He had to take it home and he put it on eBay. So he had to ship it someplace. Right. I nice think radio. I love, I love silver tone dial faces. They're always quite attractive. Yeah. That, I have a set like that too. It's a, it's a huge set, but it's got a really nice dial. And it's got the I tube at 12 o'clock yeah that's that's sharp sharp radium and it's uh, got five knobs so it must have multiple rheostats oh, right. <laughs> well they just put a knob for everything one for the volume one for the tone one for the band switch yeah, and some that just don't do anything but you think they does yeah well everything on this table yeah, yeah. Got everything from stereo, uh, you got mono blocks, and there's a the Voli audio, and then I saw a tube. Condom so, yeah, but blocks. some, I mean, you know, look at some of those transformers on some yeah. of those audio amplifiers. That's yeah, those, they, they look like the, that's a Heathkin amplifier in the background. With that's one, and, one of them, uh, Williamson amps, and you can get some definitely work out with these. Yeah, this guy builds amplifiers, his name's Carl Johnson, and he uh. He was selling off a lot of his stuff. Unfortunately, he was diagnosed with leukemia, so he's selling off Ooh. a lot of his stuff. Oh, man. I actually got that Zenith poster from him there. It's actually a brochure for the 1937 Zenith line. He had framed. Okay. Hey. Well, he had a box of tube shields. He had a box of 6T5 I-tubes. They were all pretty dim. But I got a couple of those from him. He he was known for Zeniths. Uh, he sold a lot of Zenith radios over the years. Looks like a AM FM eight track plastic radio on the yeah, right. Yeah, that's that's oh, what I was saying. I was looking because I see the 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 four tracks and I'm thinking Wait, right the one two three four. There's got to be a place to plug an eight track in there somewhere. That's the thing I'm looking for, and I even know I'm trying to look at the oh GE. There it is. I was looking for the uh, for the make. It either I've goes seen. in, the, either goes in the top or goes in the back, or it's got to go in the top. I don't know. Yeah, Probably sure. goes in the other side where you can't see it. Yeah, mm -hmm. it could be the side. Yeah, maybe. I love those '70s slider controls. They're a pain in the neck. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, That's, I've got, I've got a couple of uh, Monty Ward constantly uh, getting airlines. Dirty. That's what they make deoxid for. Yeah. <laughs> But they are, I they think are. actually the, the guy who invented those slider controls is the same guy who started the deoxic company. So yeah, that's yeah, right. <laughs> uh, he's like, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's true. But I mean, it's kind of, yeah, it's hard to get the, the tactile feel. Like, I kind of like them, but I, 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 have, I have a love-hate relationship with them. You know, they, I kind of like them because they're neat, different, but they're sometimes, you have to get the tactile feel just right so you have good control over the... Uh, over the sensitivity when you're sliding, you know, hard to get that <laughs> right. Uh, but 
very common 70s technique, that's for sure. Um, although interestingly, if I think about it, I don't think the Germans adopted it too much. Like most of my German radios are all the typically, they love push buttons. So I was going to say, they had enough things. problems with all those stupid right. push buttons. They, 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 didn't, they, didn't they, the, they didn't need the additional problem of the slider controls. Right. They had they enough issues they, with the push buttons. They couldn't button. afford all the people on the, on the service calls. You know, my sliders don't work, my buttons don't work, and I got this awful smell. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> From the yeah, the good news is life. you haven't smelled your selenium rectifier yet. <laughs> call back. Yeah. Call, call back me. When you do it. <laughs> yeah, and then we'll we'll just take care of all of it at that time, yeah. and it'll be like ten times what it's worth to fix it. <laughs> yeah, bless those Germans. But you know, there we go. It's a nice filco to the left. We'll we'll mm -hmm. we'll replace those beautiful. German speakers with like some six by nine Jensen triaxes for you. Oh, good. Yeah, I know. Like, ask ask the Saba green cone. That's a that's a that's a that's a crime. You should be jailed for a year or two to think that one over. <laughs> what do we have to the right here? Yeah, I said Esh. I might say on the tag if you can go down just to hear oh. more. A Remler. That's what it Rimmler. is. Oh, Rambler. Right. With the little Scotty dog. Yeah, right. Exactly. That's right. That was pre Scotty dog, though. <laughs> yeah, well, still good looking. Yeah, you know, this is some pretty reasonable shape. Yeah, it needs a little bit of work, but nothing super serious. It's all, you know, nice shape there. Yeah. 115, if I get the number right. In the car world, we'd say it'll buff out. It'll buff yeah. out, yeah. <laughs> or you get your your Earl Shine paint job. A, a little bit of that, um, what's that restore finish? Just you know, no problem. A little Howard's restore finish. I'll take care of it. A little, yeah. little Dupont number seven mil heart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the green can. <laughs> oh, is that the? No, that's not the same. I think it's the same model. It just he had he had one too. It was a little better shape, but that yeah, this looks in better shape. Yeah, yeah of the missing all the knobs. But... Yeah, I was gonna say move the knobs over from the other one. Yeah, yeah. there you go. You'd have a hundred dollars in knobs. <laughs> yeah, Those wood knobs. Oh, not... Did I ever tell you guys how I how I make knobs? Do you tell. Huh? Well, do tell. Is, it, is this a joke or is no, we no, this is, can this be told I'm, on YouTube? I'm dead serious. <laughs> um, you can go to um, Hobby Lobby or any of these hobby shops and you buy this um, silicon mode uh, stuff. They make it, they use it for making jewelry and things like this. The best stuff I found, it's red. I don't know the name of it, but it's a, it's, it's a bottle. And uh, it's about maybe uh, six inches high and two inches around. And and there's two pots. You mix the two together. And what it does is um, if you have a knob, if you have one knob, you can put it into like the bottom of a little box, okay, with the hole of the knob facing down on the bottom of the box. And you take this mold compound and you just pour it all over the box and fill, fill the box right up. And it cures pretty quick. Um, the red stuff uh, cures in a few hours. And when you're done, you can pop that whole chunk of the silicone. It's, it is silicone material. You can pop the whole chunk of silicone, silicone out of the box and then press on the top of the mold and pop the, and pop the knob right out of the bottom. And now you can get yourself some um, some acrylic molding compound or even fiberglass or even epoxy and just pour it into the mold and let it cure. And when you're done, out pops a knob. Oh, that's a great idea. I, I think you may be now to come to the, I think maybe you mentioned that, Rob, a while ago. That's a great tip. Yeah. I made countless, I made all the knobs for the ACR 111 that way on just one knob. <laughs> cool. Yeah. All right. Some interesting stuff. 
Oh, look at that. They'll give you some of these amps. Mm -hmm. Transformer, that. Transformer Envy. Look at that. Yeah, wow. look at that. Who needs to go to the gym? Just go up and look at those. Those are some those are some heavy pieces of iron right there. It almost oh. looks like my some my MC thirties that I have, my Macintosh MC thirties. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, those are big transformers. Trifiler wound transformers. <laughs> has Whatever anybody has anybody noticed the price of amplifier plate transformers these days? Oh yeah. <laughs> wow. It's a nightmare. It's like oh. it's like, well, sorry, this isn't restorable. Yep. Yeah. The newer TL. Must yeah. be like mid mid late seventies, I'd say guess just guessing. You don't see these are these helicopter speakers? No. These are. I don't see those that often. <clears throat> yeah, Motorola, sure these are Motorola's here. Motorola's okay. Yeah. Lafayette behind it. <laughs> it's a nice microphone on the top of that uh, yeah. Yeah. radio there. Yeah. 165 is what they seem to be if I get to read the number correctly. Mm -hmm. We get another one up here, another 165. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to fight off the urge. I was looking through the items that are on auction at uh, up in Dallas at an upcoming auction this weekend. And there's a Lafayette sort of like technician class kit, you know, young person's kit that I had. And it's like, oh, that's my radio. Should I try to get that? And it's like, duh. You got the flex. That's an easy job for it. <laughs> no, no, they, yeah, it's a tiny thing. It's a small rate, but it's five bands, you know, and it, it's got that squelch mm -hmm. control that you need for your computer. Yeah. And um, it's just a, it's, you know, it's a beginner's radio, but I haven't had mine in probably 40 or 50 years, but like, there it is. I could have it again if I really wanted it. Uh, and have well, it have a good guy, some toy. It's like the comment you made, Noah, about the, it's hard to believe that the 80s are now 40 years ago. Yeah. And the stuff you had back in the 80s, it was 20, 25 years old, is now 60, 65 years old. I know, exactly. It blows your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Nice. There's a little baby grand. <laughs> nice. We'll be seeing more of that shortly, won't we? Yeah. Yeah. And SX28 is approaching 100 years old. Uh -huh. That uh, that's a mini console. It's only about thirty inches tall. It's made by Warwick, and, it, and the brand name is Baby Grand. And try try searching for Baby Grand uh, radio on on uh, Google or something. All you get is fill codes. I mean, it's, it's information. It's almost you know. I mean, I guess you'd almost call it a chair side nowadays, but yeah, or Not bedside really a chair side. Sometimes they call those child's consoles. Mm. Yeah. There was a couple of zines, and I think somebody else made a child's console. It was just a kind mm -hmm. of like a, a, a mini console, like this thing is. But you, you know how tall those uh, white uh, folding tables are. You can see it's sitting right, right next to it, and it's about yeah. as tall as that yeah. table. Yeah. And this pipe right about like, you know, a couple of feet wide, maybe, like you know, 24 inches or so. Yeah. It's well, and again, and if, I mean, it wasn't that long ago that. This kind of stuff was, you know, 20, 25 bucks or maybe even free on Craigslist. Yeah. Oh, I know. Can you imagine all the stuff could have had, you know, 30, 40 Yes, years I can imagine dirt. because I had to get rid of half of it to make my move. It was awful. <laughs> <laughs> well, even in that, that video series from PBS where it was in the 80s and the, at the swap meet, the guy was charging five, he had like, five radios and he paid $15 for all of them. Yeah. Here's a couple of neat Emersons. The ones on the right. Yeah. There's this two-tone, I don't think I've ever seen one. Of these what you say there. It's actually different. Emerson, uh, 
157. Yikes. $175. Yeah, yeah a little, is that Emerson on is that Emerson on the right there? I I have that radio. Oh, do you? That one right there. He's yeah. asking one twenty five. Yeah, yeah the good news is you're rich. There you go. Got your one hundred twenty five dollars. Richer. And that doesn't that doesn't look too good at condition there. Yeah, no. it's, it needs to be cleaned up. But like the grill cloth looks a bit. Yeah. But that yeah, might be one of those curtain burners too. Curtain mm -hmm. burners. With the resistance line cord on it? Oh, yeah. You pay extra for that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you pay your premium for that. <laughs> well, it, says it becomes a heat source. You know, when it your makes it, it, light it's, up. it's rare. It's a combination. You want your, you want your house rare or medium rare? <laughs> uh, All right. You know, <laughs> well, we want it well done. Yeah. Have any of you ever heard of a LISCO grid dip oscillator? TV I've heard of good. grid dip oscillators before. But... Yeah, but well, years ago, there was a company called Lysco, L-Y-S-C-O, and they were one of the early makers of grid dip meters. And uh, this had no transformer in it, and you plugged it into the wall. That's how it worked. It, they, they connected the low side of the AC line right directly to the chassis, and they lit up the tube by using a resistance line cord. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how many hams this thing might have killed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure there were a, there were a lot of yows over it too. <laughs> Nothing too exciting in that pile. No. Nah. No, oh, this is all that. That's all that stuff. I was lamenting the fact it all got thrown away in the eighties. That's another view of the same table that had those. Right. Uh, yeah, he's got another Emerson here. Yeah, well, Philco cigar box. Uh... Oops. About that. Yeah, Philco cigar yeah. box. Looks more like a toaster to me. Look at those slots. You're just begging to the <laughs> <laughs> You know, that's size for a Pop Tart. <laughs> <laughs> well, those four tubes in there got pretty hot. You probably could make right. a Pop Tart in there. Yeah, I slid a Pop Tart in there. It's the rare <laughs> Philco Pop Tart. <laughs> oh, we got here. And uh, there's a Zenith. Something yeah. particularly yield. What's that radio? radio? What is that thing? A piece of military gear or something? Oh boy. Anybody got any ideas? This no. I'm unsure, but this is out of the out of the range of like what I can zoom in. That, that was a rate that was an early radiola. One one side was just like an RF deck and the other one was the amplifier. Okay, yeah, and you can see they. I think some got the antenna. On there. I don't think that was original, but maybe I'm wrong. I think, I think they were RA and DA, uh, right? Actually, if you look that's behind right. you, the, guy, the guy holding that white radio, that's me. <laughs> ah, look at that! Uh, Aha, caught me. You were the one that ran away with that radio, and didn't pay for yeah. it. I got you. That little thought I followed me home. <laughs> I see. Oh, that's a oh right. I forgot model that is. I was a nice little radio. That is cool. I yeah. like my seven ninety a lot. That's a nice radio. Yeah. Philco model twenty there, that big cathedral. Yeah. Some people think that was the first uh, cathedral, nineteen thirty. One of the first, I should say, but generally regarded as one of the first cathedrals. What make is that? Philco, model twenty. Yeah, didn't Emerson make a similar one? They might have. Yeah, that one and there was one Echo Phone. I think it was was a another uh -huh. cathedral came out at the same time. But most of those Philcos, the model twenty, that grill work is is missing out of them. But it's yeah. rare to find one where all the lattice work is still there. And last but not least, 
Now, where are you, Greg? Are you lurking about? Is that you? That can't be you. That's me right there. Aha. Uh -huh. like, uh -huh. like my dad standing next to me there. <laughs> Caught in the act. There you can see the first table there where they had that expensive. Uh, oh, yeah. You see the RCA. I mean, the ZFTO and the Motorola speakers and the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, there was maybe, oh, I would say maybe seven, eight vendors there. It wasn't a huge meet by any means, but. Uh, well, we'll do this. Stuff. I'll uh, share my screen of the photos of the yeah. acquisition between January and November. Just uh, reshare when I get to the. Let me switch. Ah, oh, here we go. All right, Greg. Here you go. Oh, here we we do a sales pitch while you're here too. Yeah, that one I've, I've got on the radio attic. That I picked. That was one up. I picked at the January meet where there's three vendors. There was like two, two radios I picked up. And that was one of them. And I think there's a before picture of it somewhere. Too. Yeah, that's the next one in line. It just didn't order it by. There's the original. That's how it looked when I got it. I like the color you chose. Yeah, it's very well. Fit. These, something was, besides white. It was the cabinet was pretty well scratched up, and I went with something to complement the dial a little bit better. Yeah, I like it. I like the I like the contrast. And it's a good period. Yeah, color. nice. You know, you did a nice job. That's an airline. A little airline about 1952, I think. Yeah. yeah. Plays really well. Uh, yeah, the five tube, micro tube. Is it? Does it have the American five in it? Well, it's the all American five. Yeah, you could call it that. It's, it's you know the typical twelve BA six BE six, yeah, 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 yeah. AV six all that. Yeah, yeah, nice choice. Aha, here's the chair side. Maybe grand all restored. That looks. You did a really That's nice beautiful. job there. That's that needed beautiful. a lot of woodwork. It was falling apart. I had to do a lot of clamping and gluing on that. Just about every every yep. seam was separated. Yep. But, uh, In there. There you go. Now that's, that's a nice looking style piece. Yeah. It's a, it's a pretty radio. Very most everything also. most everything I own is ultra grand as opposed to baby grand. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't need at least three people to move it, why bother? Well, yeah, yeah that, that's exactly right. Yeah, this was not a very heavy console to carry, that's for sure. And the, you can see the chassis sits at an angle like that. It was kind yeah. of you had to actually take the shelf out to get the chassis out because you couldn't get to the bolts underneath the chassis. Uh -huh. the, the two in front were way buried up in, under there. It looks like there's room to put a much more robust speaker in it than just I know that. it's rather. Yeah, that had a really dinky speaker. Yeah, it's, it's gonna... modest, isn't it? Come on, we got to fix that up. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it really emphasized baby. More power. Well, I think what it was, it was a table model they put into a little console cabinet. I still have to use that thing, Greg. Is that a 5Z3, that, that big tube on the right? Well, that was part of the problem with this radio. I found a schematic for it, and it didn't match the schematic. Somebody replaced the power transformer, and it has all two-volt tubes in it instead of the, the traditional tubes it was supposed to have in it. It's got the two-volt equivalents, like a 2A7 and a 2A5 or Ah, that was a head gotcha. scratcher because when I got it all recapped and everything, I plugged the right tubes in it and I couldn't figure out why they weren't lighting up. <laughs> huh. I was trying to power six volt tubes with a two volt transformer, it didn't work too well. No, see, you needed some of those rheostats from that first radio, <laughs> ah, <see? laughs> but that's actually how it looked, uh, I think, before I restored it, yeah. Oh, okay. Home. Boy, it's kind of dusty. And... Yeah, that's very attractive. I really like it. Yeah, look at that. I mean, come on. That's got to have that's got to have at least a 10 or a 12-inch triax in it. Boom. Yeah, yeah, got boom. <laughs> now, who, who made that? The chassis was made by Warwick. Uh -huh. Warwick Manufacturing. Did a nice job there, Greg. Really nice job. Yeah, very nice. Thank you. Yeah, it was missing that little, I had to make that little triangle part of the dial. 
Ah, why you did her? Oh, the picture of it. Got the brash shim, shim stock and I cut one out and kind of made it to look like the picture. That didn't serve a purpose. It was just decorative? Just decorative, yeah. There was nothing. There actually was nothing printed on it. It was just a little triangle thing. Use so, this knob first. Yeah, there yeah, we go. Your tuning well, knob. Use <laughs> is this the volume knob or, or is the tuner? Middle knob is the tuning knob, so that's probably why I was pointing to that. Here, if you want to oh, want to make this needle move, you turn yeah. it down. <laughs> this must be. And this was a. Well, let's see. That's that's the one I just finished. That's a. a uh, it's the uh, Clarion. The Colonial. Clarion Tombstone. The colonial, I'm sorry. Colonial, that's right. There I we just go. Finished that, and there is no there is no schematic for it. That's how I looked when I when I got it. And I just uh, was able to salvage the original finish on that one. That's a pretty, nice, pretty shape. nice shape. Yeah. Did you? Yeah, leave you know, temperature? schematics just limit your creativity. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> there you go. But I think it was made. They made some radios for silver tone because that dial is very similar to like a thirty six yeah. silver. Still an attractive, uh, an attractive dial face. Got a little, you know, got the big radio tower and transmitting yeah. over the U.S. and South America. Are those and wooden knobs? Yeah, wooden knobs. Yeah, it's got the uh, the second, the split second hand too in there. Yeah, it's kind of a. Oh know, yeah. It's tiny so little like needle. A... You can barely see it there. Yeah, this one here. Position. Yeah. Is that for uh, fine fine tuning? I, I guess it could be. Yeah, in place of like an eye tube or a shadow meter, you can get close to where your station is with that little needle. Hmm. Basically, there, so you could charge another ten dollars for it. Probably, it's only a five tube radio. It's nothing that outstanding in that respect, but oh. kind of unusual because oh, there's a. That was the other one that I picked up in the January meet where we had three vendors. There was about four radios, and I bought two of them. That's <laughs> pretty neat radio. That's a Corona brand. Yeah. Come on, Corona. Do, 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 do. Not to be confused with the Mexican beer. Yeah. Well, or global pandemic. Oh, it's right. My, uh, the, no, the My Corona model. Yeah, My Corona. My Corona. Actually, it's actually quite nice, really quite nice. It is nice, really. Nice dial on it, yeah. It's a... what, yeah. Finish, what finish did you put on that? That's Mohawk toners. Okay. Of course, it's the it's the right hand drive version. I prefer the left hand drive version, being left handed. <laughs> so. Ah, okay. I see. Yeah. Actually, on some of the other uh, meets that we showed pictures of, this guy had this radio in about four or five of our meets and he had a ridiculous price on it and he finally i don't know it was a coal that got to him but he, he he had about half of what he wanted for it at the previous meets and then so we were able to come to terms finally uh, yeah yeah it's called you know waking up and realizing what it's really worth kind of thing exactly. you know exactly. but he realized he's getting hauling at home because there's a very limited set of buyers that day yeah it's one of those you know i'm the only person here who wants to buy this so you can sell it to me or i can make sure you own it for the rest of your life <laughs> <laughs> So you, had you, to won't stare even be, you won't. I don't even want to give away. To give I don't away. want to give away too many of my secrets of negotiating. You know, radios. So do you have like it's just a stare down? I like, personally can hour. make sure this haunts you for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of felt sorry for the guy because he he carried in crate after crate of. He had all kinds of manuals and stuff. I think he had a whole set of writers' manuals he hauled in there. He was going to try and sell, and there's nobody there buying that stuff. You can yeah. buy it in a CD now. Yeah. You can just, you know, a lot of things. It's amazing how much you can get just for free off the internet. Oh, yeah. yeah. If you go to the worldhistorysite.com or whatever it is. Or Nostalgia it's, Air or, you know, Nostalgia all kinds Air. of places. Yeah, you can get the whole Rider series, the whole Bikeman series on online. 
Yeah. It's supposed to look nice lit up at, at night, I imagine. It, it does, yeah. I don't think I took a picture of it. Well, it's lit up there, but it's a little too bright to get the full yeah. effect of it. There's a lot of different colors going on there. That's before. You can see, wow, what a nice difference. Mm. I think this is going to go back to the before. Look at that. Whoa, how rich looking. I was able to salvage the original grill cloth. Yeah, I was thinking it looks... That's good. That's always worth, well worth it, even if it's slightly soiled or slightly, you know, yeah. if it's not in bad shape, it's nice preserving it. That's the Tell NOAA me. version Tell of me. the radio. Yeah, uh, when you take it out, it's not real faded. You can, this one wasn't really faded or anything, so it was worth saving. Some of them, you know, you'll see around the outer yeah. edges what color it actually really was, but this was, this was pretty much how it always yeah. was the whole thing. Great shape. Yeah, it was great shape. Yep. Come out pretty uh, nice. And there's that little uh, uh, Pacific brand that uh, picked up at the Racine Meet in November. Well, this is pretty neat. You know, the uh, dial face is actually unusual. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And plus a, dial, you know, a tuning eye for a, such a relatively modest radio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it has. Yeah, it's, it's not bigger than like a Philco Transitone, one of those little like 46 200s. About that yeah. size. Oh, there's a that look at that. That go. looks yeah. awesome. Oh. That's nice. And you can see the plastic on where it where the Yeah, the I can see your point. Inside. Probably looks even more noticeable when you have it like, you know, all lights around completely dark, glowing. We man, we need more we need more amateur police nowadays. We do, yes. That's cool. This was the chassis. Oh, is that from the? No. That is well. That is the one that. Uh, um... Let's see. Twenty-five yeah, and twenty-five is fifty plus six plus six plus six plus seventy-five. That's what was all stuffed in that little white box. <laughs> A lot of 50... chassis. Really? Yeah. Well, you've got that L49 ballast tube, so that takes up some... Uh, 125. I'm going to thing glows. Yeah. You can see the eye tube laying in the back there. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Yeah, yeah. L49. Oh, interesting. Yeah, they stuff a lot in that little package. And naturally, that L49 ballast tube was no good, so... Thankfully, I had one here that would... Yeah, surprise, surprise. Surprise, yeah. Because it, there's a hole in the top of it that blew the top out of it. I don't... Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the top is gone. <laughs> that was wow. the first clue. Yep. Yeah, I've had a couple of the death cap um, people tried to use, like, the bumblebee caps for death caps on the... Oh. Line line side of things, and they're just like oh, those little tiny changes. little little tiny pieces on either end, and nothing in between. Yep. Mm -hmm. This shield's got a good dent. I wonder if I popped off here, <laughs> ricocheted, and hit this. <laughs> Could be. You know, I ran into a guy that was selling those bumblebee caps. Ooh. You out of your guys like them things. Yeah, I know. And I asked them, I says, they don't they get aren't they kind of most of them? I, I haven't seen very few of them that were not leaky. So well, you know, the same the guys who buy those are the same guys who buy the like speaker wire at like ten dollars a foot that makes no freaking difference whatsoever. Sorry. No, no, no. Oxygen don't get me started. Free wire. Right. <laughs> you could use a freaking coat hanger or some <laughs> bx cable yeah i mean i i had a i, I had hey, a really good you know, I, a really, I worked for hewlett packard we made network analyzers mm -hmm. i worked for hewlett packard for 39 years and i had a friend who was a systems engineer who meant supposedly that meant he was smarter than i was and because I was in marketing, but he was in R and D, 
and he swore by this like speaker cable with you know characteristic impedance of 8.0 ohms and it's like you freaking make network analyzers i mean there, there's no difference you know you can sweep this thing of over so, um, any frequency range that you want and and it's just it doesn't make any difference piece but, of he wire. Was, but he was adamant that he had to pay yeah. you know whatever a hundred dollars per centimeter for this stupid wire yeah. that didn't do a damn thing it was, so it was does the great. hp 80 does the hp 8505 mean anything to you oh absolutely yeah i have two of those <laughs> wow 1.3 megahertz i think they went up to That's what they did yep yeah there you go there was a that was a <laughs> nice that's a nice network analyzer yep but i mean it could prove to you that like at audio frequencies you really mm -hmm. weren't making any difference nope nope there it is Ooh, look at that Man, that's, that's beautiful a, that's a sweetheart right there so if i can highlight you i had the back cover on it Ah, mm. and all, all those tubes there are surprisingly heavy. <laughs> Did you bring it to the front there again? Yeah, look at that. Yeah, that's it's amazing. They stuff a lot in that little box. Sure did. You're getting a little exercise doing that there, uh, Greg. <laughs> Just crank up R2 a little bit so it really glows. <laughs> 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 right. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, it's yeah, just a tiny little crack. Screws tight to the cabinet on the inside. Yeah. It's like a stress crack here. But yeah. yeah, that's the only crack in the cabinet. Surprisingly, that's not unusual radio. I don't see those very often. No, a uh, terrific little radio. It's a nice yeah. radio with the with the electric eye in there. Yeah, yeah. no, it, it's a high tech radio in a small package. That's great. Yeah, you know, yeah. kid kids use kids love to watch that electric eye. You know. Oh, sure. They get, they get mesmerized by it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I remember that's what caught my eye was, you know, my, my dad's, uh, you know, German radio, it's Telefunken, and my aunt's one. His had the EM80, said the, the, the fan style, whereas yeah. my yeah. aunt's was oh. just a year, a couple of years newer, had the EM84, which is the vertical bar. But I remember a little kid loving looking at it because it had this cool, light turquoise white color. And, yeah. you know, and, and uh, so you could stare at things and that's really cool you know so it makes an, an, uh, an, yeah, I know. an impression i have a question i want to ask tom does that goonie box in the background work the gonset oh. oh, tom you're muted that the the gonset in the background does that that goonie box does that still work uh, that is my shack in 1953, oh, so I'm okay. sure it still works, but uh, that okay. was a long time ago. A long That's, time ago. Uh, that was uh, the, the setup I had back then. Oh, okay. It still works, but you don't yeah. own it anymore. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. It's like it the, the Helicrafter's dual diversity receiver that you see there. <laughs> you know, I, don't, it, it, I don't own it, it anymore. Yeah, seems to be a revival of these among a lot of the VHF guys, and they're going yeah. into VHF AM. You know, <laughs> those so, were fun days on VHF yeah, AM, two meter AM in the fifties. Yeah. Yep, that's right. <laughs> Boy, Gonset sold a lot of those for civil defense. Yeah, they, they did. must have sold tens of thousands of them. And the, the wiring's not all that great, and the, there's nothing very neat about it. I'm surprised no. that they stood up so well. And, of course, the vibrators would fail regularly in the power Absolutely. supply. Yep, yep. Well, yeah. guys, I guess I probably should be close to the, we're close to the witching hour, and I suppose I should let you guys go. Well, it was very entertaining tonight. Yeah, it was terrific. I appreciate. Thank you again to the presenters for adjusting their uh, schedules by a day, and for everybody who attended, it was great. I uh, really appreciate that. But hopefully, in two weeks, we'll be back on our Wednesday uh, normally scheduled day, and up with a uh, topic for that. But I'm sure we'll come up with something. 
But anyway, uh, it was it was terrific. Great, great stuff between the Giblin tuning circuit uh, analysis, and of course, uh, always enjoys what what the other clubs have to offer and what Greg always brings home, <laughs> and does a terrific job restoring. So in the interim, you guys stay warm or at least stay dry, and uh, and we'll see you probably in a couple of weeks. All right, thank you, John. Yeah, thank, thank you, John. Thank you very much. Sure, Thanks, thank everybody. You. Yep. Good night, y'all. Good, 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 Good night, everybody. Good night, John. Good night, John. 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 Yeah. I'd be happy to work with you on that audio problem. I don't. It's a really weird, strange distortion. Did you ever get a chance to listen to the recording to hear what I was talking about? I listened to part of one. It, I did catch it. I was like, "Well, what am I doing? Like, can you hear me clearly right now?" It's, um, it's fine right now. Yeah.